Hey, I'm Julie McKenzie. And I'm Tristan Dunwell. Welcome to episode 96 of the Scrum Podcast. Uh, Tristan and myself, we're very excited to speak to our guest this week. You probably know who he is. You've probably seen him on TV if you watch TSN, whether for their regular coverage on sports, whether it's the Stanley Cup playoffs, whether it's a big event like, hey, the Super Bowl, or if you've sat for a couple of hours watching Trade Center or free agent frenzy coverage, then you've definitely seen this guy. James Duffy, our guest this week. Uh, He has a book out called Beauties, which tells a whole bunch of untold hockey stories from guys like Wayne Gretzky in there. Sidney Crosby is in this book. You have a tale about Ray, uh, Ray Emery in there. Haley Wickenizer, hockey legend, also a story from her in this book. It's really interesting. There's also a podcast to go with it as well. Uh, James Duffy broke that down with us uh, on this week's episode. James Duffy wrote a book about anecdotes and about stories. Let me tell you one that happened uh, right when he, when he logged into the Zoom call. And it just, just, it just goes to show how much of a genuine person, how much of a genuine good person James Duffy is. He comes in. And he, he's got the AirPods. And the first thing he says is, can, can you guys hear me okay? Uh, I know it's been, I've been having trouble and I just want to sound, I just want to sound right for you guys. Um, oh, you know what? Maybe if I try with my phone, I think we'll, I'll sound better. Let me do that again. Logs back out, logs, logs out, logs in with his phone and then tries and tests out. He's like, oh, okay. Yeah, no, it sounds better. Actually, you know what? It doesn't sound as good for you guys. Let me, let, me, let me do it back again. Sound as good as I can. He tried that and really let us know what the best sound was uh, for our specific recording. Um, gave, us, gave us a lot of time. Gave us uh, a lot of great questions. And he went through his voice memos, which uh, I'm not going to tell you who, but he plays us a snippet and we both had... Uh, um, our, our eyes were as big as uh, Toonies. And uh, I mean, not to say it's impossible that we'd ever get this mystery person on, but uh, we're, we'll consider right now the closest that person has ever been to being on the Scrum Podcast until the day that actually happens. Uh, James was really great with us. Uh, we hope you enjoy him too. He's by far the best James we've ever had on this podcast. I can't think of anyone else who could come close to that. Uh, James Duffy. Without further ado, take it away. Hey, it's James Duffy from TSN. I host hockey and some football and some golf, occasionally some basketball. I have a book out called Beauties, Hockey's Greatest Untold Stories, which is the perfect Christmas gift for hockey lovers and non-hockey lovers. That's my shameless plug, and I'm thrilled to be here. James Duffy, we appreciate the shameless plugs. We appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for joining us on the Scrum Podcast. Uh, Let's talk about your book and podcast, Beauties. What made you want to do this project? Oh, great to be here, Julian and Tristan. Apologies if you hear any extraneous noise. I have two puppies in the room who uh, tend to want to tear everything apart. They currently have a cardboard box. So I slowly pick up items from around my floor until there's nothing left and they attack each other. Uh, Why did I want to do this book? That is a loaded question. Uh, First of all, I didn't want to do, after I wrote my last book, I said, I'm never doing a book again because it's just a a lot of work. Anybody who's written a book compared to what I do for television, it's just, it just takes a lot of time. But I think sitting on that panel, Julie, in all those years, sitting next to Hall of Fame players and coaches and insiders like Bobby Mack and Dregs, I heard so many amazing stories, but they couldn't, stories they wouldn't tell on TV, right? We'd finish our pregame show and we'd have our feet up on the desk and then they'd start telling the real good stories. And I said, if I could ever put all these in a book, because you can read a lot of sports books that are kind of autobiographies and there'll be a few good stories in them, but you have to kind of go through the whole, I grew up on a farm in Saskatchewan and all that stuff. And I said, what if we could just, just have great stories. And so that was kind of the idea for the book is that I just asked 60 guys, Tell me your favorite hockey story, the best one that you would tell if it was Julian and Tristan and James and you in a bar. And we say, what's your favorite story? Tell us that story. So that was the book. So you're, you're in an interesting position where you, you by, 
through your time at TSN, I'm assuming you've probably met quite a few of of, of those very big names in, in sports. Right. But, uh, but what was it like reaching out to these players to get those stories and, and then putting all of that together uh, to make uh, chapters and pages in a book? Yeah, that was, I think that that's always the thing you're most anxious about. Um, first of all, is will people want to share the stories? Because if you want the really good stories, there has to be a trust factor, I think, involved. I wasn't so worried about retired players. I, I feel like with hockey in particular, when players retire, they open up a lot more and they're more willing to tell stories. I was more worried about the Sidney Crosbys and Connor McDavid's who, you know, sometimes hockey players get the reputation of being boring as they often are in those intermission interviews, but it's partly our fault because we ask them dumb questions. Um, but I was really surprised at how, First of all, how good the stories were from guys like Crosby and McDavid and Anze Kopitar and guys who are still playing. I, I was really pleasantly surprised. And with most people, I think in general, everybody likes to tell a good story, right, if they have it. And so as long as they trust you and know that you're not going to, you know, try to screw them somehow in the way you tell the story in the book. Uh, I, and so luckily, I think I, I had enough trust with those guys and, and uh, I was able to get some pretty good stuff from them. In the book and podcast uh, for beauties, you have a good combination of, of funny, silly stories like how Sidney Crosby earned the nickname Daryl. And then you have more heartfelt stories, such as the ones like Ray Emery trying to come back from hip surgery. Uh, just of all the, the different stories you were able to put together, uh, which one was your favorite to, to hear? Well, it's, you know, Julian, I, I've, I've tried to figure that one out. And I don't know that I have a great answer yet. Like, it's kind of like asking your favorite child, right? Mm. And I have a favorite child. I just can't say that publicly because the other two would get mad. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so, but it is like that. Like, I don't, I think that uh, it's interesting. I think people would probably expect me to say, you know, Wayne Gretzky gave me a story and, or Crosby and uh, the big names, but I think in many ways, my favorite stories are the ones that are not the biggest names. Uh, there's a, a chapter about Scott Foster, who was the emergency goalie in Chicago who came in. Everybody remembers David Ayers who came in for the Leafs Carolina game, but Scott Foster happened three years ago. And in many ways, I think it's a better story because David Ayers had practiced 150 times with the Leafs. He knew all the Leafs players. He faced all their shots. Whereas Scott Foster was a beer leaguer. He was an accountant. He'd never even met an NHL player before. And suddenly he's in an NHL game. So, and the other thing about Scott is that he, he did his post-game scrum. And then he decided not to do any more interviews. He just wanted to go back to his normal life as an accountant and a dad. So he never really told his story before. And so those ones to me were, were more fascinating, I think, in many ways than... Uh, than the, you know, the famous hockey players and probably the chapters that people who buy the book will be drawn to the most uh, weren't necessarily uh, my favorites, but I do, I do love them all. I think there's, it's kind of like that when you, when you, when you create a book, it's, they're all kind of your babies. Right. And so there's no, there's no chapters in there that I finished and like, Oh, that chapter sucked. I hated that one. <laughs> no, absolutely agree. The journalist in me really loves those types of stories um, so you were on, uh, on the Jay and Dan podcast recently and, and you told them, uh, something, I, I mean, I still can't wrap my head around, um, that you would get voicemails from Sidney Crosby, um, telling you uh, some, some, some stories. Uh, I'm just wondering what kind of feeling is it to look at your phone and see that you got voicemails from, you know, one of the best players ever. Yeah, I haven't done this before, but I, I was thinking, uh, I'll try to find one for you guys. Okay. Sort of play, it, play it here real fast just so you yeah, get a taste of what Please. I'm talking about um, as, as I'm talking. So that was really interesting because it's a challenge to get a hold of these guys during this, the season, uh, particularly January, February, when the playoff races are already on and, and you're asking for an hour of Sidney Crosby's time or an hour of Connor McDavid's time. And they got a ton of media requests, right? So uh, that was that was going to be a challenge from from the beginning, really. And uh, I'm just trying to find these as I do it. I may may not be able to pull them up online here, but uh, that was the weirdest thing. I basically uh, uh, got one 
the first day it pops up in my phone and it's like, Hey James, it's Sid. So I thought of this one story with me and Colby Armstrong. And then a week later, it's like, Hey James, it's Sid. It was just the, the kind of the cool, the kind of the, in many ways, cooler than a phone conversation. Right. Cause I think just randomly he's on a plane or he's in a car somewhere and he says, Oh, I'll, I'll tape a story. And I, I was really, really wowed by, you know, a guy like that to be able to take the time, you know, to, to do that and to actually think about it. And I think that's kind of the way Sid approaches life, right? Everything he does, he goes a hundred percent. So when he commits to doing this book, he wants to tell me a good story. And so he gives me like eight, eight different ones to, uh, to choose from. So that was really one of my favorite parts of the entire process. I'll continue to look for this. And if I find it uh, during the questions, I'll, I'll play it for Please. you guys. Please, we have yeah, no problem interrupt interrupting. Us. Please do. Uh, is Sidney Crosby automatically the coolest person who's ever left you a voice message? Oh, 100%. I think that would be. <laughs> <laughs> um, it wasn't even a voice message. It was a voice memo. Like he yeah. records them in his phone and then sends them to me. That's, that was the cool thing. It's beautiful. That's incredible. I can imagine you probably, ha it's probably buried amidst a whole bunch of other different voice memos for this project among uh, other things you might have going on. And of course, you know, you're able to get guys like Sidney Crosby uh, send you that kind of stuff. I'm just curious, uh, were there guys who were a bit more hesitant to kind of share those stories? And, and if you can, if you're willing to kind of, you know, just talk more about those guys who are those guys and, and and what was it like trying to get some stories that maybe they didn't necessarily want featured in a book or a podcast right. okay here's Sid I think so okay let me, uh, let me play this for you guys and see if it works cool uh, one of the memories I have was uh you know back when we said roommates um actually I shouldn't, shouldn't say that they're still roommates it's only for guys in entry-level contracts but um but, you know, it was more common for everyone to, to room together. My roommate was Colby Armstrong, and he had been called up. So, I won't let the whole story go, but that, that was what would pop into my phone every couple of weeks. Can you guys hear that okay? Yeah, yeah. we heard that fine. Now we can now say Sidney Crosby has been on the Scrum Podcast. Well, Thank yeah, you, James. Yeah, we say that. To Sidney Crosby. <laughs> we had Sidney Crosby as a guest on the pod. Um, but anyway, just, just, just a classy guy. Uh, I didn't have too many, frankly. Um, I mean, I made it clear to the guys that I didn't want anybody unhappy with this book, right? And so I, I suppose I could have tried to get some super controversial things, but I, I didn't want to push it. I wanted, if, if someone was going to give me their time and their trust to tell a story, then, you know, I didn't want the book to come out and for them to go, oh God, I wish I hadn't told that one, right? Or have to issue denials in the, in the media or something like that. So I fully let them know, hey, I want you to tell me a story you'd be comfortable with in print. Did I prod, you know, a few people to get stories out of them? Um, did some, there, there was a couple that told me stories that afterwards, you know, wanted me to take a few things out here and there that they weren't comfortable with once they saw it in print. But very, very little uh, when it came to things like that. I know it, it's it's typically more about the story and less about the name. Although I, I'm assuming your your editors at, at uh, the you know, whatever want some big names, but is there right. someone that uh, you know in in book X or uh, a future project that uh, you would like to know some of their behind the scenes from? Like a hockey guy, for for instance, or I mean, it could be anyone that you you just you interested in. Well, I mean, look, there's a. I could have gone on forever. Uh, it's funny when, when I started this process, you're at first terrified that you're not going to get enough stories, right? You, you sign a deal with a publisher. They want this book and you have six months to write it and you go, Oh my God, what if I can't get enough stories? And what if nobody wants to be in my book? I think the typical insecurities that you would have in a situation like this, And so I was just throwing out anybody who, anybody who I came across, I was like, do you have a story for me? Do you have a story for me? Uh, and then in the end, I, you know, I had too many. I realized I could have done four books or five books and I, and I could probably do a sequel if, if people wanted it in, in a heartbeat. Um, but one person I, I just ran out of time with was Mario Lemieux, who I talked to at the Hall of Fame and was, you know, was happy to, to said he was going to be happy to give me a story. And Mario doesn't give a lot of, interviews and such it doesn't tell a lot of funny stories so that's what I really wanted was to get like a humorous story from Mario Lemieux because he, he always seems so serious 
Um, but I, I just ran out of time in the book to, to, to get Mario. Uh, there are stories about Mario, but told from, from a couple of his teammates, which I think are great within the book. But somebody like that, uh, like I said, I, I haven't decided yet if I'll write more of these, but I think something like Beauties kind of has an endless, right? You could write 20 chapters, 20 different versions of the book. And, and uh, there's a ton of people I'd still love to have in there for sure. We definitely have a soft spot, at least for myself. I mean, coming from Montreal, definitely Mario, uh, one of the one of the greatest of all time. You should have uh, been it, the goat. Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna open that debate. I don't know where you. Got <laughs> <from>. uh, <laughs> I, we can't have you on the show without talking at least a little bit about one of my personal favorite moments of yours is is those trade deadline days and free agent frenzy um, live broadcasts on TSN. They always have star-studded lineups for both occasions. Uh, and I think one of the uh, best particularities, I think, for myself watching them uh, forever has been when these days are filled with deals, the TSN insiders are the stars of the show. And then when on occasions when deals are few and far between, you really become the star. Um, with all of the experience of recording those shows, how has your experience of going through those popular long live shows have been? Well, first of all, it's interesting you say that. Uh, I, 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 I feel like on the days when it's quiet, uh, guys like Dregs and Bob are some of my best friends in the world. And I actually resent them. Like I, 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 I don't know if I've ever shared this, but I, I, I look back at them and there's nothing happening. And I, and I have this like hatred towards them. Like it's their fault. <laughs> why, why are you hanging me out to dry like this? Right. They'll just shrug their, I'll look back like anything going on and they'll shrug their shoulders and I'll be like, assholes. Why, why, <laughs> why are you doing this to me? I guess that's, this is like therapy for me to share that with you guys. Right. Mm. Um, but I've never told them that, but uh, <laughs> no, it's, I, I think that, I have a love hate relationship with those days. I used to really dread them in many ways because it is mentally exhausting to talk for 10 or 12 hours. And when nothing was going on, it was, uh, it was just, it was just hard. And then I think I sort of just came to terms with it a few years ago that I, it's somewhere inside my brain. I said, well, you know, if nothing happens today, if there's not a single trade, first of all, it's not your fault. So And second of all, you have 20 really smart guys in a studio that you could talk hockey with all day. And I think in many ways that I think the popularity of Trade Center and Free Agent Frenzy is that, is that people, they know there might not be a lot of deals, but they're just going to watch anyway because they love hockey. And here's a chance. Who, want, who doesn't want to sit and listen to Bob McKenzie and Ray Ferraro and so on and so forth? We used to do a lot of really goofy things, right? We, we had... Uh, Uh, and that, that's the most pressure I felt is I have a quirky sense of humor and would try to come up with things to fill time every year. And they, they kind of started depending on me where TSN would come to me a month before and say, okay, what are you doing? What are your, what are your bits this year? Uh, and I'd be, am I the only guy that could come up with bits here? Because I <laughs> ran, ran out of material after about 10 years, but, uh, You know, we've, I think we've toned that down a little bit as well sometimes. I like to do a little bit here and there, but not too much. Uh, it got a little bit out of hand a couple of years where it was like a three-ring circus in there. Um, but so I, I think as I've gotten older, I appreciate the days more. And I, I think that we, we get great ratings because it's kind of like rubberneckers at an accident scene. Everybody just wants to see, like you're asking the question, Tristan, like what everybody wants to see how we can fill the time if there's no deals and uh, – I think that's part of the sicko allure that you folks have for this show. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know how you guys do that, man. Just filling in all that time. And, and you mentioned things kind of going off the rails. The first thing I thought of was when uh, Jennifer Hedger got shot in the chest by that uh, T-shirt cannon by uh, Martin Biron. I don't know if you were alluding to that moment, but uh, I'm well, sure that, there's been quite a few. That's probably my favorite year of Trade Center in many ways because um, I will take credit for this. That was... I said to myself, I, I was running through ideas and I said, why don't we pretend it's like a, like a hockey game uh, and we do all the bits that they do during the timeouts in the arena. So you have the t-shirt cannon, 
I think we had those prime ministers from Ottawa that, that race around, right? So we, we brought them in and we did the kiss cam and we did a whole bunch of stupid things that I, you know, to me, comedy, if about 20% of people think it's funny, I'd rather have that than everybody think it's funny. Like I like stuff that I think's funny, but maybe not everybody does. And I thought it was fun. And, and that just worked out so perfectly where we, they had the t-shirt cannon and they, I think we got that from the senators as well. Maybe, no, maybe from the Leafs. And they told us beforehand, do not like, you know, there's a level, like you could go level one through five or something on how, how far and five was when they shoot it up into the bleachers. Right. They said, do not go past two in a studio. Right. Do not go past two. And it was the end of the day and I was feeling uh, mischievous and I'd been shooting the cannon. So I gave it to Marty and I flicked it up to like five and I did not. And he shot it at the same moment. Jennifer was walking by and <laughs> we were, I was terrified for a second that we had like injured Jennifer Hedger, but she was fine. It was just a, one of those moments that kind of lives forever, right? That you can never recreate. Wow. You remember that? Remember that episode of The Simpsons where um, uh, Ned Flanders' wife gets hit oh, by a t-shirt no. cannon? Right. That's that's. I got vibes from that. I mean, thankfully, yeah. the conclusion to her to Jennifer did not happen the same way. But no, like, I, I got know, vibes people, of that. People thought we scripted it, like that it was somehow planned. It, it was re- not remotely planned whatsoever. Like she just happened to be walking by or standing over there. Marty was aiming a completely different place, but couldn't control the gun, and and it got her right in the abdomen. So it was uh, that was uh, <laughs> oh that was that God. was a funny one. That oh one, and God. I think a couple of years before we had Gino and the uh, llamas. Uh, yes, and that, in the parking lot. <laughs> a week before, like it, if people look at that now, they say, "Why were there llamas on the show?" But a, a week before Trade Center, or maybe it was the Friday night, and Trade Center was on a Monday. There was, had been a llama chase in Arizona. Where yes. They yes. Were live. So that's why, and in two days, I give my producers amazing credit. Uh, they got llamas from a zoo to be brought in. And uh, the first time we had the llamas in the studio, I said, the only way this bit's going to work is if uh, nobody even acknowledges them. I don't want anybody saying, oh, my God, there's llamas in the studio. Just c- carry on with our normal conversation about the Leafs power play or whatever. And the llamas just be walking around in the background. <laughs> and then Gino did the great bit with the, with the uh, we, I guess we had a drone or something in the parking lot that we pretended was a helicopter. Or no, maybe we actually had the CTV helicopter over That's the amazing. building. And Gino was, Gino was corralling the llamas. So just really stupid, but it was a lot of fun. One of my, one of my favorites, uh, and, and it's, not, it's not even like that big of a deal, but it was that, there was that one year where the only trade for like hours had been this like AHL deal. Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> Maxine Sauve to... for Rob Flick. And uh, we were so desperate that we got, I think we got Rob Flick on the phone. Oh, and no. just, it was funny, first of all, because his name was Rob Flick, right? And two guys, <laughs> even diehard fans had never heard of before. And I think my first question was like, all right, uh, Rob Flick joins us now, uh, involved in that deal earlier for Maxime Sauve. Rob, um, have to ask, uh, who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I said that, but I, I certainly felt like saying that. Oh, that was that was yeah. That has to be one of my favorite moments. Is I mean, it worth you writing? Made a book that guy on? feel like an absolute star, by the way. Like, that was. I don't know whose idea it was to call him up, but that was yeah. beautiful. Oh, James. Um. So we made a huge theme of this podcast talking about uh, the untold hockey stories you were able to get for beauties as a broadcaster. uh, Do you happen to have any personal untold stories from your time that you might be willing to share on the scrum podcast? Maybe during your time, you know, covering sports, maybe during your time as a touch football star. I know you sometimes like to talk about that as a, Ontario C Division Touch Football Champion. Do you have a cool untold story you'd like to share with us on the Scrum Podcast? Julian, you're the first guy of all my book interviews that's brought up my touch football career. So you have a automatically get a warm place in my heart for that, buddy. Um, I appreciate that. I appreciate you know, that. I I uh I think I wasted all my great stories in my last book, The Guy on the Left, which was not really an autobiography, but I just kind of had all these stories from my career that I wanted to to put together in a book. And, and, I, and so most of them are, 
if I was to tell you a good one, it would probably be plagiarized from the guy on the left. Uh, since you mentioned football, though, I'll uh, let's see. What can I tell you? I did get knocked out in a uh, in a game once. Uh, just a, like literally knocked out. That was kind of the end, near the end of my touch football career, probably only six or seven years ago. Come up, just with like a head to head collision coming across the middle. And the next thing I, I knew I was sitting on the sidelines, like I four minutes of my life were just completely lost. So if you see me go like a little bit uh, bleary eyed on television sometimes and not remember uh, where I'm going, it's probably because of that, that incident. Uh, it wasn't oh, exactly a funny story, but there's my. Wow. Uh, my all the all the guys at work like the Gord Millers and Ray Ferraro think it's hilarious that I was knocked out in a touch football game. So, um, touch football goes hard. Touch football is hey, touch football. A lot of the guys make fun of me about touch football or flag football, but if you guys have played, you know you get guys who played CIS football or whatever, and they uh, they take it darn seriously, right? So it's some good. There's some good level, good level touch football out there. I played. The, uh, I played group. flag football. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no, <laughs> like that. I was going to say, I played foot flag football in high school, and uh, I can concur. It's, uh, it's very tough. It's very hard out here. Also, uh, this is more for Tristan. How many times have we had guys on this podcast uh, mention CIS and not U Sports? <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. That's fine. No, no that's totally fine. You're good. Here, I'll tell that you- is not on you at all. I'll tell you what I do because I, I don't expect you guys to have read the guy on the left. Uh, or any of your listeners. So I'll tell you one really quick story, um, which I tell sometimes when I do speaking engagements. And this is a 100% true story, not embellished whatsoever. Uh, My very first week of sports casting, uh, that was in Ottawa. I was a local sportscaster in Ottawa. I was really young, 24, 25, extremely nervous, and very green. And my microphone fell off my jacket lapel, down sort of into my lap. And this was like the 11 o'clock sports cast on the local station. And I didn't, I panicked. If that happened to me today, like on TSN, I would just reach down, pick it up, say, oh, apologies, and and attach it back to my coat. But I was so green and so nervous that I panicked. And so I I was in the middle of a bunch of baseball highlights. So people, I was not on camera, right? The video was playing and I was just talking. Right. So I just kept doing the highlights. And, the you know, you have an earpiece and the producer or director in my ear is saying, your mic, your mic fell down, your mic fell down. And I just was, I just kept going because I didn't know what to do. I was so panicked. Well, we had a floor director who's the guy who kind of points at the cameras back in those days. They don't hardly exist anymore. And so he realized this idiot wasn't going to get his mic. And so he climbed down under the desk to come back to try to reattach my mic myself. So basically, uh, I'm still in the middle of these highlights And he's down, comes up under the desk, and his name was Paul, French guy who had, like, big 80s afro. And he he was trying to reattach the thing with not a great deal of success. And and basically, the video ended. There was an end of the highlights, and they had to come back to me on camera. (laughs) And so for the briefest moment, it was only a second or two, and thank God social media didn't exist back then, and Twitter and Instagram and these things. They cut back to me on camera, and all you saw was this scared kid standing here like this, and you could see the top of a man's head bobbing between my legs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good <thank> God. <laughs> and so, like, that would have been – so I made my sports casting debut and my, you know, gay porn debut in the same week. <laughs> what? <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but – no, I, uh, you know what, it's, uh, it's, uh, Oh no. Yeah. So, uh, that was, uh, that was, uh, Hey, it it was, it was what it was and everybody laughed about it afterwards, but I'm thankfully there's no gift or something on that. Uh, that was uh, my first week of sports casting. I somehow survived. Wow. Oh, bad James. Uh, We have have one last gay porn, right? I mean, gay porn's a thing, right? Oh, it is a thing. (laughs) Yes. Yes. I mean, I don't know. No, you could, you could, you could fail. You could. I'm cool. You, you good if I call you fail? Yeah, of course, man. <laughs> Tristan, can you take the last question? I can't stop yes, laughing. Absolutely. So, uh, James, we 
you know, we heard you uh, in your little description off the top that, you know, you've done quite a few different sports. Uh, you didn't even mention soccer. I, you know, you were, I saw you doing the live broadcast at, uh, at Stade Olympique uh, in, for the Women's World Cup. So you, you right. even did soccer. If you had to rank, uh, if you did say a top five of the, the, the best sports events that you get to do time and time again on TSN, uh, if, if, if there is so such a ranking, Um, where would things rank? Well, how about if I do it this way, like just do the best all time events. Like if, sure. if I was to do like a yearly thing, because I, that was a world cup, the women's world cup you saw me at, right. Mm -hmm. uh, which was one of the highlights. Like if I was, if I was to do my annual thing, I'm off to the masters this weekend. Uh, the masters is always one of my favorite events of the year. It's kind of the, usually the beginning of summer and I love golf. Uh, The World Juniors, so the World Juniors and the Masters are probably my two favorite. Probably the World Juniors is first, the Masters is second, but kind of one and one A. Uh, I love the Super Bowl and the Grey Cup. I think I love the Grey Cup more just because it's so Canadian. Yeah. It's a lot more yep. fun. Go to the Super Bowl, the actual game is great, but, you know, it's too big. for. I'm a small town guy. The parties and stuff, I'd rather be Grey Cup with Canadians. Um, but if you were to go all-time – Tristan, um, I would say the 2010 Olympics would be number one uh, to cover, you know, the Crosby goal and, and that Olympics in Canada. I was always an Olympic geek. That would be my favorite event of all time. Number two might be the Raptors run. Uh, I was wow. fortunate enough to cover their championship two years ago, and uh, that was my first job at TSN back in the late 90s hosting NBA. People don't remember that. So that was a huge thrill to be back doing that and to witness that championship. Ah, uh, geez. Uh, the, the Women's World Cup of Soccer was a huge deal for me. I, I played soccer growing up, and anytime you cover a World Cup, that's definitely in the top five. Uh, you know, like, I don't know if I could pick my favorite World Juniors. Uh, there's been so many. But one, I'd, I'd have to put a World Juniors in there. Maybe the one in Ottawa where Everly scored because it was back in my hometown. That would be in the top five. And maybe Tiger winning the Masters two years ago. Uh, the same year the Raptors won. That was a great year in general. I think yeah, I'm probably forgetting a few, but those would be right there in, in my top events ever to cover. That's a That is a solid top, top five. five. <laughs> yeah. yeah, That's amazing. Uh, James, I mean, I, not much can be said about that. That's an amazing set of top five. And it's just crazy to think that like, you're just, you've, I just, you're just kind of synonymous with, so many sports that we've been able to see on TV for the better part of, of two decades. Like that's, that's an amazing accomplishment. And the fact that we're able to talk to you about this on our podcast is an absolute honor and, and, and uh, no, privilege. Thank you, thank you so much. I don't know if it's, it, it's not so much an accomplishment, I think as a privilege for me, like I've been incredibly lucky to be able to, you know, for TSN to put trust in me to cover these events. And uh, I've, just I feel incredibly lucky for it more than anything else so I, I don't think of it as like look at what I've accomplished look where I've been I look at it more as holy crap have I been lucky to be able to have, have been at these places and at least been able to to witness them and report on them and as far as being on your pod guys it was a true pleasure <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Scrum Podcast. If you want to send us questions or share your stories, shoot us an email at thescrumpodcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at the Scrum Podcast and individually at Tristan Damour and JKA McKenzie. I'll let you figure out at home which Twitter handle or Uh, yeah, they're all Twitter handles. They're not uh, Instagram or Facebook or anything like that. I'll let you figure out which whose Twitter handle belongs to who. You're definitely Tristan, huh? Yeah, I I can't get. I was I, supposed I to be put, a Tristan. I was supposed to be a Tristan. Yes, yes. I I love I love the alternate reality where we're both Tristans, and the obvious name for our podcast would have been Between Two Tristans. Tristans, obviously. I mean. Like it was like it would have been right there. James Duffy between two Tristans is pretty funny. I mean, it it just you know the comedy just writes itself. If you're interested in sponsoring us or buying ad space on the show, shoot us an email once again, the scrum podcast at gmail.com, and we'll get the ball rolling.
You can also support us for free by leaving a rating and review wherever you listen to this podcast and by sharing this episode with a friend. Maybe James Duffy is your friend. You can share it with him too. Why not? Why not share the episode he was on? You know, that's, that's, that's not a bad idea. Why not? It's an interesting just, move, but you're just you're just stroking his ego. Absolutely. Special thank you to Cooper Richardson for letting us use his music as our intro. His SoundCloud link is in the description. This show is produced and edited by Kevin Laramie as part of the Sports Podcasting Network. You can find all of the network shows at sportspodcastingnetwork.com. Special thank you to James Duffy for talking to us about his book beauties and just about his time with trade center and free agent frenzy and his days as a very green sportscaster in his hometown of ottawa uh tristan we we, we talked about this uh off air uh and we we kind of mentioned it off the top too about how great of a personality james duffy is i'm just really happy about the fact that he was able to talk to us and how you know, normally sometimes you get a bigger guest and, you know, they're, they're really good and all that. But sometimes you get more of the interesting stuff from uh, people you might not know. This was one of those podcasts where you get the ent- the high entertainment value. You learn something new and you get the big name guest with it. And, and James Duffy is somebody who deserves all the, play- all the praise, all the flowers for the jobs that he's done uh, covering sports in our country. Absolutely. I mean, I can't say anything. I can't say it better. Um, and yeah, it, it just tells, it just tells how good a person James Duthie is. Um, yeah, special shout out again to, uh, producer Kevin, um, and, uh, special updates, uh, for the people that have, uh, um, been following the show for a little while. Um, I looked at my, uh, birth certificate. Uh I now know my full, the extent of my, the full extent of my name. Uh, we're not going to the double digits with the, with the middle names, but I, there's, there's a couple, there's a couple, uh, place your bets as to what my middle names are and uh, where they're from. Cause one of them is specific. Um, and that's pretty much what we have for you guys. Uh, we really do hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if it's your first time listening to the show, please consider subscribing J-Mac, always a pleasure. Likewise. We appreciate you. The 100th is coming real soon, guys. Oh, yeah. And as always, we'll hear you all next time.